Pharisees were outraged by the hospitality of Jesus, the hospitality that he offered to tax collectors and sinners. Matthew 9-11 says this, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12 and 13, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. See, the Pharisees were great at offering sacrifice. And they struggled to offer mercy. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. In our text, there's this clear connection between sickness and sinfulness. One more time. There's a connection between sickness and sinfulness, where sickness almost becomes like this word picture to designate the impact of sin, that sin disrupts everything. Now, a couple times a year, like five times a year, I get sick. Like, I'm talking like a, why, stop. I, I'm talking about like a runny nose sick. And when I have a runny nose, like, death is right around the corner. I'm not trying to push through. I'm not trying to persevere. I am shutting everything down. I just want to get in bed and call it a day. Because when I'm sick, everything just feels off. It impacts everything. It impacts how I think about work. It impacts how I think about my relationship. Everything just feels cloudy and almost hopeless. My wife is so much more resilient than me, and she laughs at me and mocks me and judges me because she could persevere through all of it. I can't. When I'm sick, it impacts everything. And I think this is maybe a good picture of how sin impacts our life. It disrupts absolutely everything. Remember how we talked about we were created for deep and abiding relationship with God. We see that in the garden. We're looking forward to that in the new city. But the reason we lost relationship with God, the reason we lost intimacy with God is because of our sin. Sin is simply the rejection of God and his will over our lives. It's choosing something over God. I was really good at choosing other things over God. Sin is simply choosing my will over God's will. I'm still pretty good at choosing my will over God's will. This is what sin is, and the impact of sin is that it's disrupted our relationship with him. Now, maybe you're here and you're kind of thinking about this whole following Jesus and Christianity thing. But if you can imagine there being a God, I don't think it would be hard for anyone, anyone in this room, to accept the reality that we have rejected God and his will over our lives. The scriptures actually paint a really dark picture of humanity and how each and every one of us have been infected with this sin sickness. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says this, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Psalm 14.3 says this, All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Super inspiring stuff, right, guys? For all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. What's the point? All have sinned, and all of us are sick. But this is why Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for those who are sick. And the Pharisees, who are steeped in Old Testament theology and the sacrificial system, should have known and should have been able to make this connection that they, too, were sick, that they, too, needed healing and hope. They, too, needed a healing Savior. But their pride, their pride kept them um, from seeing themselves in the same position as these tax collectors and sinners. These Pharisees, they were up here. Everyone else was down here. What about you? Is your pride keeping you from seeing your sin sickness? 
from reaching up and calling out for the healing hand of God? What's keeping you right now from acknowledging your need for the healing hand of a Savior? And when I've got my little runny nose, I go to CVS, and there's 30 options. And sometimes death really is around the corner. I grab all 30 options. We live in a world, when we think about our spiritual life, where there are endless options. We live in a pluralistic society, and I think that can be good and healthy. No one's going to force you to believe something you don't want to believe. But you have to decide at some point which worldview makes the most sense to answer life's biggest question. And though we live in a world of endless options from a Christian perspective, all of those options fall infinitely short of what Jesus offers. Jesus is the only one that's worthy and capable of securing salvation for us. Jesus is the only one that's worthy and capable of healing our sin-sick souls. And this is why Jesus is lifted up as the good doctor and the great physician. One more time, let me hit us with a couple texts. Psalm 147.3 says this, He heals the broken hearts and binds up their wounds. Isaiah 53.5 says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Peter, one of the apostles, one of the disciples of Jesus, would draw upon Isaiah 53, and he would say this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. No one else's wounds, no other path. By his wounds, you've been healed. The Bible's answer to our broken and fractured relationship with God is Jesus. The Bible's answer to our sin-sick souls is Jesus. And specifically, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. This is all according to the glorious and perfect plan of God. This is what God has been working towards from from the garden to the new city. He's been working on this plan, played out on human history, to create a pathway back to himself. And the call in the Bible is not new city, here's 25 things you need to do. Here's 30 new places you need to visit. Here's some virtues you need to put on before you make your way to God. The call of the Bible is turn from your old life. There's a Bible word called repentance. Turn from your old life and look to Jesus in faith. That's it. And that's available to everyone here today. It's not about scratching and clawing our way back to God. The blessings of the gospel are applied to our life when we look to Jesus and we grab hold of Jesus simply by placing our faith in him. And it doesn't have to be perfect faith. It can be like a faith of a child or a faith as small as a mustard seed. All God calls us to do is to look to Jesus as the only one who will bring healing to our souls. In a world of endless options, look to Jesus in faith. Now, I know there's a good amount of us that have been following Jesus for some time. And I feel like one of the traps I fall into, the further and further away I get from my old life, I feel like the enemy starts working. My worship gets compromised. And my worship gets compromised because I start believing that, you know what, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I had a little sin in my life. But God sure is lucky to have me on his team. And when I start believing that, my, my worship begins to diminish. Uh, my my, my self-understanding elevates, and my understanding of God's grace and mercy towards me, again, begins to dissipate or diminish. So I think there's a spiritual discipline as your pastor and friend. For those who identify as followers of Jesus, I think there's a spiritual discipline that we have to incorporate into our lives. We have to continue to rightly remember where we were. And where were we? Sin sick. Where were we? Spiritually dead. Where were we? In needing of healing and hope. We were in the same place as tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, gluttons, and drunkards. We weren't up here and the rest of the people down here. We were all together needing the healing hand of Jesus. And again, as a spiritual discipline, I think we have to continue to go back and to remember. 
And when we rightly remember what happens, I believe we begin to rightly worship the God of all grace and the God of all mercy. Thinking about the vision of our church and where we're going to be in 2024, and where we're going to be for five years from now, ten years from now, I hope we as a church will always be radically hospitable. That we might actually build up a bad reputation because of the type of people that feel welcomed in this room. But there's another component to Jesus' ministry. I want us to be radically hospitable and courageously bold and kind and loving in holding up Jesus as the answer for all of our lives. It's both and, not one or the other. And we learn this from the ministry of Jesus Christ, who was full of grace and truth. Anyone and everyone is welcomed here. And they're going to be on their journey, not according to my timeline, your timeline, according to God's timeline. So we don't need to force anyone to believe anything or change anything. That's God's business. But we want to continually lift up Jesus Christ as the only one in a world of endless options who brings real healing and brings real hope. That's my prayer for this church. New City, so what does this all mean for us? I'm going to ask three questions, and we're going to wrap up. Question number one, really quickly, are you pre-healing or post-healing? Pre-healing or post-healing? And wherever you're at, the call is the same. Look to Jesus in faith. If you're pre-healing and you've kind of been on the outside thinking about the claims of Jesus, I just want you to know that the beauty of the gospel is not about what you need to do. It's about what God has done for you. And all that God calls you to do is to look to Jesus in faith. And when you do, you're welcomed into a joy-filled, forever relationship with God. God now sees you as a son or daughter, and there's nothing that can disrupt you from the love that God has for you. If you're post-healing, what do we do? We continue to look to Jesus in faith and now worship for the healing that he's brought into our lives. The call is the same. We want to place Jesus at the center of our lives and walk by faith and not by sight. Number two, this is kind of a fun question. Are you more of a party planner or a spiritual surgeon? Which one are you? I think we have some people in this room that have the gift of hospitality. And we have some people in this room that love truth and are unashamed of the gospel. And we love both people, and both people make this community stronger. I think the call for all of us is to have a little bit more party planner, a little bit more hospitality, and a little bit more commitment to the gospel, and the gospel being the, the, the good news for all people. We want to be hospitable in the way we live, and we want to continue to hold on and hold up God's glorious good news. And finally, can you know God personally? Absolutely, yes, and amen. You were created, we were created to know God, to walk with God, and to find life in him. There's nothing you've done in your past that can keep you from knowing God today. One more time. There's nothing you've done in your past that can keep you from knowing God today. We've all gone astray. We're all wandering lambs. We've all been affected by this spiritual disease. But from the garden to the new city, it's this beautiful story about God. God is the hero. It's about what God has done to create a way so that we can know him fully and rightly. And my prayer in this moment right now, and maybe this will make sense to some of you, maybe it won't, but my prayer is that the Spirit of God would be working in this room tonight and moving inside of each and every one of us so that we would look to Jesus, see him clearly. We would see him as our, our Lord and Savior, and we would place our hope and our faith in him. And as we hope in him, we would continue to experience more and more joy in this life. New City, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we're thankful for just the opportunity to gather in this place to worship and to open up your scriptures. From beginning to end, you demonstrate yourself to be a good God, a gracious God, a merciful God, a God who desires 
relationship and intimacy with each and every one of us. And I just pray that your spirit would be moving in the life of our church so that Jesus would be front and center of this community and front and center in our personal lives. That we wouldn't be distracted by all the things we might do, but we would live in light of your rule, your reign, your love, and your mercy. We thank you that you've created a pathway for us to know you. And if there is someone here that is thinking about taking those steps, I pray they would talk to somebody they came with. They would come and talk to one of the leaders here. I pray that they would take that step of faith and experience the joy of being called your family, your sons and daughters. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.